We've got an amazing guest coming up, actually two amazing guests coming up, joining us via video Skype in the next segment. Oklahoma City uh, investigators, one of them who was there when the bombing, you know, in, in the aftermath. Uh, that is coming up in the next segment. We are continuing our series of interviews to document what really happened in Oklahoma City on the record this week. And I'll do it next week and into the new year, at least once or twice a week. Because there's so many amazing people that are interviewed and then some that aren't. In this film, A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995, uh, Jane Graham, the head of HUD, who was in the building and saw known feds planting bombs. She didn't know what they were at the time, big gray sticks of butter. They said they were with the telephone company. Uh, you've got the inventor of the neutron bomb saying clearly that uh, there were explosives inside the building, the newscast admitting it as well. Uh, you've got the former head of Air Force Weapons Development breaking it down. The mother of police officer of the year, Terrence Yankee, the first to respond, who saw the feds running around involved. They, of course, killed him. It's an amazing film, and you need to show it to police and military especially. Because the uh, Obama administration has put out, what, three different memos saying a new Oklahoma City would really help them. They don't even veil it. They don't say we're going to do it. They just say it would really help us, and if there's a new one, we're going to blame the right wing. And uh, barring that, we're in deep trouble. And I see all of it moving towards that. Now, our exposure of it may stop them. And I've been talking a lot more in the last year about Oklahoma City again, as you know. I mean, I, I made a 40-minute film within a film. And I've made a lot of films that are like three hours long, like Road to Tyranny, that's really three different subjects. The History of Terror and the New World Order, Stage Terror, then Oklahoma City, the First World Trade Center, and then into 9-11. Now... Uh, th this video is available at InfoWars.com, and it supports the filmmakers and, of course, my operation when you get it. But but bottom line, get it. Air it on Access TV. Have local showings in your area. Just like with my films, get my films. You're authorized to make copies of my films. I want all of my, my videos out there to everybody because this is a life and death situation. Uh, I mean, you watch my police state films, you'll understand what's now unfolding. Now, let's stop right there. Uh, Don Browning is a retired Oklahoma City police officer, a former U.S. Marine and Vietnam veteran. Don worked in the K-9 unit and was part of the search and rescue team at the Murrah building after the bombing. And we're going to go through some important questions. And riding shotgun uh, with him is Holland uh, Vanden Neuenhoff. He is a native of Oklahoma and served as a rifle squad leader in Marine Corps. Uh, Holland decided to get off the bench one day and started writing and passing out leaflets that exposed government corruption and cover-ups. These efforts led him to collaborate with the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee in their efforts to uncover the truth behind the OKC bombing. He was instrumental in the formation of the first low-power FM station in Oklahoma to fight the globalist. I had that part that uh, focused on truth and freedom issues, carrying my show, of course. Holland engages in a variety of endeavors to spread awareness in his community. Absolutely, and fight the criminals that have taken this country over. So both these uh, gentlemen uh, join us, uh, good American patriots and Marines fighting the tyranny. And from my memory, Don, I've never talked to you, but I believe you were one of the guys who got threatened, too. We've talked to the other guys, some of the people off record, uh, D D Department of Defense, bomb disposal, you name it, where they said, don't ask questions about the bombs or we know where your daughter goes to school. Just just incredible. But Don Browning, uh, great to have you uh, joining us via video Skype today. And we, we appreciate your courage coming on air. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, I could babble all day, but why are you here? What did you see? What is most important for us to understand? And uh, Holland, you can you know, pretty much, because you know him well and have studied Oklahoma even more than I have, uh, where do you think we should go first? Well, we can start with uh, the day of the bombing, of course, when Don responded and the get into the evacuations that were later denied that they took place and the explosives that were found inside the building. Uh, Don, you were the first to respond, one of the first to respond to the bombing, right? Yes, sir. And uh, you and your dog, uh, Gunny, right? Correct. And uh, one of the main points of the movie, what we try to emphasize is the fact that there were several evacuations uh, after the initial bombing that they were later denied. They said they were fal uh, false alarms or hoaxes. But in A Noble Lie, we have videotape from a sheriff's deputy 
taken during one of the evacuations that shows the ATF pulling weapons and plastic explosives out of the building. No one has seen this tape. Well, some people have, but it's been passed down hand to hand. We digitally remastered the tape. No one has seen it in this quality, and it's never seen widespread publicity. Yeah, by the way, that's the kind of stuff that's in this film, is many of your team have been on this for over a decade. I mean, this is a obsession uh, to, to, you know, to get the murder of these children out. I mean, this is, that's why it's so important. Well, this is my hometown. I grew up in Oklahoma City. And once I started realizing what had happened, I felt it was my duty to, to expose the truth. I saw that no one else, well, I mean, every other people were doing it, but I wanted to really get the story out to the people. I, we found a team, we got a good director's team, production, editing, and we, we made the movie as the best way to get the, the message out to the, out to the masses. Exactly, and it's the only you know, well-done testament in modern times. So let's get into why Don is such an incredible witness and such an amazing expert. Well, Don, um, you were actually in the building with the, in the canine rescue units, and uh, during one of the evacuations, uh, what were they doing during the evacuations? Uh, as far as the initial evacuation, we're just trying to determine the location of the victims, uh, really trying to determine uh, how to uh, remove some of the debris. Uh, at about 11.30, uh, 11 o'clock that first morning, we were halted for the first time. Um, ordered out of the building uh, for no other reason than, than they wanted to secure the building. Uh, on a limited access, we were allowed back in. Uh, in fact, I worked for a little bit uh, in the area with uh, Dana Bradley, who's had her leg amputated uh, due to being pinned in the building. Uh, worked in that area for the next little bit, and then finally we were ordered out by the U.S. Marshals. Uh, we were sequestered pretty much on the uh, south side of the uh, Murrah building uh, in the courtyard area. Uh, was kind of held at bay, told that we'd be allowed to go back in and search, but there were files that were so critical to the government that until those files were found, there would be no more rescue or recovery. And there were people still inside? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There was a gentleman that was, uh, apparently he was already deceased, but he was still laying, uh, bleeding out on the uh, south face of the building. And you could see that and they wouldn't let you recover? Yes, sir. And because they had to recover documents? Correct. Uh, what's important about that, Alex, is that that may be, may be one of the reasons that this happened, is that they, their priority was on the documents for some reason, recovering those documents to the detriment of the people who were trapped inside and died. As uh, the Oklahoma City Police Chief uh, said on camera, that we lost people because of the evacuations. We lost people because of this. Because sure, and, and, and we have all the newscasts where the governors, yeah, they found more bombs, they're, they're taking them out, that's another device the bomb squad has, and here's Don Browning, who was there uh, you know, with the dog, uh, and, and was a police officer, and also a, a, a Marine veteran, so he, I mean, just amazing to see what was going on. We only have those newscasts. What did you see with them and the reported bombs? Uh, there was uh, uh, two different incidents where they, they claimed that they had uh, uh, determined that there was a secondary explosives device. Uh, they they uh, quarantined that area. I did not actually see them re remove the device from the building. Uh, uh, it was more to the northwest corner of the building, from what I understood, in the debris. Uh, and I was still yet on the south side, uh, close to the elevator shafts. But these evacuations did take place. We have affidavits from first responders saying that there were at least two other bombs discovered in the rubble, that one of these bombs was timed to go, to go off 10 minutes after the first explosion. This is a, a typical terrorist tactic is to have at least two bombs, one to attract responders and the second bomb to inflict even greater casualties. So there, I mean, this could have been worse. That's a bad thing about Oklahoma City is as bad as it was, it could have been much, much worse. Now, going through some of these questions, what really got you asking questions, and, and I'm going from memory and secondhand, Don, uh, how did things progress with the feds telling you to get out of there? Were you ever threatened like some of the other police were? Yes, sir. Uh, at one point that morning, I was uh, advised that we were going to be arrested uh, by federal marshals if we did not leave the immediate area. Uh, uh, like I said, we didn't want to be a hindrance. We didn't really understand what was going at that point. Uh, so we did withdraw and stayed uh, sequestered there on the courtyard yard area uh, uh, in hopes that we were going to be allowed to go back in 
And uh, uh, interestingly, we were advised at that point that no police dog would be allowed back in the building, that there would be the search and rescue dogs would be coming in from private sources. So they couldn't trust the uh, Oklahoma City police, but they'd have some special people uh, coming. I want to get into all the technicals and the uh, horse patrol being mobilized before the bombing and what Terrence Yankee saw and, you know, you know, really the key points here with you, sir. But bottom line from 16 years of researching this, being in it and what you know and seeing this film as a police officer, as an investigator, as a veteran with a lot of different perspectives and and. and, and and wisdom, what do you believe really happened with Oklahoma City? I personally believe that there was a, a secondary explosion. I don't know whether it was sympathetic to the truck explosion uh, and that it was just uh, uh, armament that was stored in the Murrah building. Uh, but due to the uh, destructive uh, nature of what, what occurred, uh, in particularly in closer to the uh, East side of the building on the south side where there was was just total destruction. I do believe that there was at least a sympathetic explosion. Uh, exactly. The, the damage pattern to the building, when you look at it, is asymmetrical to the truck bomb. It's offset from the major damage to the building. The crater is offset from the major bite, as we show in the movie. Uh, it's on, on the, the other end of the building from it. And we can see it right behind you there. Uh, the truck bomb was basically where your shoulder is. Uh, Holland, uh, you're a shoulder that's facing you know, uh, inward towards Don, and yes. then if you see back in the corner where the uh, earphone is, where Don is, that's that's where you had columns blown off at the base. And Parton says uh, that it was you know, specifically charges on those columns. Yes, uh, we interviewed General Parton. Uh, I believe one of the uh, first interviews ever anyone's ever given him on 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 video, and he was a former um, head of Air Force Weapons Development. He spent twenty years blowing things up for the military and conducting bomb damage analysis. This is his job. He saw what happened in Oklahoma City. He saw the damage. He knew it could not be an ammonium nitrate truck bomb. So he he analyzed did his famous. Parton report, which concluded that the columns inside the Murrah building were destroyed due to Brazant's damage, meaning that there were contact explosives on the columns, that the truck bomb was not the sole cause of destruction that day. That truck bomb did do a lot of damage, and it was powerful, but what it would have done to the Murrah building was basically blown in all the windows and damaged the facade, and certainly was Well, that's what you see in uh, Saudi Arabia with trucks full of pull of military grade is it just blows the facade off and blows things through the building sometimes both sides but the columns are right there the supporting columns were there and the mur building was constructed in the 70s with bomb resistance in mind because there was a, there was a lot more uh, political instability going on in the in the post 60s era back yeah, then yeah communist bombing stuff you know. yeah exactly it was a federal building it was designed with with bombs in mind and those columns would not have failed due to a truck bomb. That is an impossibility. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, was not even allowed on site to do their own analysis. They, they did an analysis, but they were kept 200 feet back. Well, that's another issue. They, they blow up the wreckage, more than half the building standing there. They act super suspicious. They threaten people. Hoppy Hottelberg, police officers, doctors that show up. Uh, the, F, the, the ATF's in their full gear like a minute after. As a police officer, Don, watching them act so suspicious, I mean, what does that look like to you? And what did other police officers t uh, tell you off record their view was on this? Uh, one one of the bomb uh, uh, officers uh, was describing to me one of what he thought was a one of the secondary devices. And he said that he had a clock real similar to it sitting on his desk, uh, which was just a, a, a three-road stick of dynamite with an alarm clock. Uh, stuck on it, just kind of a decoration uh, type thing. And uh, I really was serious about trying to convince me that that's what they thought was a secondary uh, device. And I, uh, of course, we kind of then we got a little more more involved in our conversations, and he said that they did find nitrous bottle uh, end caps, uh, you know, other things that would help accelerate the uh, info bomb. Exactly. One of the stories they uh, propagated to uh, cover one of the evacuations that, that that three different bomb squads had mistaken a toy alarm clock as a real bomb, which is ludicrous and uh, no reason to evacuate the entire building before that could actually be concluded and ascertained on the site. You wouldn't evacuate the building before you actually determine that it was a bomb, especially because there's people inside bleeding out. Um, but you've got pieces of the building blown the opposite direction away from the truck bomb on top of the building across the street. 
Exactly. That truck bomb exploded on the north side of the building, yet uh, north of that, across the street, there were chunks of the Murrah building that somehow transported themselves against the blast wave of the truck bomb. And that's the thing about this, this whole story is that it is a conclusive fact that that truck bomb was not the sole cause of agent, yet... The cover-up has gone into effect. Everyone on the scene knows that the truck bomb was not the sole cause of destruction.